Good afternoon, and welcome to those tuning in from the United States. Uh, it's not afternoon in South Korea or other places in the world, but we're delighted to welcome you um, to a Wilson Center webcast entitled uh, Bridges and Blockades, Life at the DMZ. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center. I served nine terms in Congress, and during that time, went to uh, Pyongyang as a member of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, then went to South Korea, was at the DMZ myself from the southern side, and we'll hear a lot more about it than, than I know, uh, but it's going to be a great conversation today. Uh, the day before, uh, two days before, June 25th, which marks the 70th anniversary of the start of the Korean War. Well, it's often dubbed the Forgotten War, the Wilson Center remembers the legacy and impact. That begins with the acknowledgement that the, the Korean War hasn't ended. The armistice agreement signed in 1953 was never replaced with a peace treaty. Whether in times of relative peace or of rising tensions, as we've seen recently with North Korea destroying an inner Korean uh, liaison office and threatening to remilitarize its border with the South, Understanding the Korean War is essential to understanding the Korean Peninsula today. The Wilson Center gets that. We have a history and public policy program uh, which has provided crucial documents which have generated numerous books. Uh, you'll hear more about uh, what we're actively doing uh, with our, our focus on, on uh, South Korea. Uh, I don't want to Spoiler alert, I don't want to talk about it yet. Um, but today, we are talking about the latest issue of our Wilson Quarterly, which is devoted uh, to the Korean War. And we're decide delighted to launch it right now. The issue, which you can find online at wilsonquarterly.com, takes a novel approach to the war by examining it from a variety of perspectives on both sides of the 38th parallel. But there is no place where the conflict is more present than at the demilitarized zone that separates the two Koreas. Until just a few weeks ago, today's speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Morrow, served as commander of the UN Command's security battalion inside the DMZ, a place known as, quote, the world's loneliest outpost. No doubt about that. Uh, we encountered him, we were just all talking about this, in 2018 in South Korea, but we're delighted, uh, first of all, that we know you, and second of all, that you're with us today. Uh, Scott Morrow arrived at the DMZ a day before the 2018 Singapore summit and hosted President Trump for his famous handshake with Kim Jong-un and brief border crossing a year ago. In between, he oversaw a remarkable period of detente and military cooperation between North and South. So obviously today we'll discuss whether that ends or whether there's a way back. Um, I look forward to hearing Lieutenant Colonel Morrow's perspectives, and I know he has many fascinating stories to tell. Also joining today's webcast are Gene Lee, the one and only Gene Lee, the daunting and brave Gene Lee, our Korea Center Director, and Abe Denmark, Director of our Asia Program. Before they joined the, the Wilson Center, Gene spent two years, I think, as the AP's Pyongyang bureau chief, the first ever bureau chief for an international journal. Uh, and while Abe kept a close eye on the DMZ as the deputy assistant uh, secretary of defense for East Asia. Introducing Lieutenant Colonel Morrow is Richard Byrne, the talented editor, current editor of the Wilson Quarterly. Just a little history here. When I arrived at the Wilson Center from Congress nine and a half years ago, the Wilson Quarterly was a print-only magazine, which was losing a fortune and went to uh, mostly uh, people at the sort of upper end of the age bracket. Uh, and we looked at it, and there, was, there were many who thought we should just end it. And some of us said, no, let's make it all digital, and it was a process. We got there, we won a few awards on the way, and then 
Richard joined us. And now we have spectacular Wilson quarterlies, which reach a much bigger audience and not just at the upper end of the age bracket. So Richard, congratulations um, for all you do and a special congratulations on this issue of the quarterly. Um, over to you, Richard, to introduce our speaker. You are muted. Okay. Richard, Thank you so much, Director Harmon, for, um, for being here and introducing our talk. I'm delighted to be here as the editor of the Wilson Quarterly and at the launch of our new issue, and also to be part of a really timely discussion about one of the world's most significant and volatile borders. And it's a discussion I'm happy to say features three authors with pieces in our new Wilson Quarterly, which is the largest issue that we've published since we moved online in 2012. So I'll return at the end of the conversation um, to have a few last words, but I'd like to pass over the baton now to Jean Lee, director of our Korea Center, an acclaimed journalist, and my very strong collaborator on this issue. Here's, take it over, Jean. Hi, everyone. It's so, um, it's wonderful to be able to host this event just before the start of the Korean War. Um, now, we don't normally mark the beginning of a conflict, but as Congresswoman Harmon mentioned, it's been 70 years and there has not been an end to this particular conflict. So we thought it was, it was important to recognize this conflict because it has such bearing on what's happening, not only on the Korean Peninsula, but in the region today. I am actually going to hand over um, to Lieutenant Colonel Sean Morrow, uh, and, and he will join us for a moderated discussion after, but I would really like for him to share what it's been like. I have to say, Lieutenant Colonel Morrow, uh, you arrived uh, the day before the Singapore summit and you left before the current tensions from North, the threats from North Korea, so perhaps we need to send you back because clearly, you oversaw this remarkable interlude of peace in the DMZ. Um, and I would like for you to share a little bit of what that's like, because the DMZ is such a mysterious place. It's a very theatrical place, uh, it, but it is a place where people are living and working with this tension. And so for you to perhaps share a little bit of the behind the scenes of the day-to-day -day operations over these past two remarkable years, is something that I'm so pleased and honored that um, you can share with us. All right, thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Harmon, uh, Jean and Richard and Abe and, and all the team at the Wilson Center. Uh, it's been a phenomenal experience uh, bringing this article uh, to print and, and being able to recollect and reminisce on the last two years uh, in the joint security area in Pamela and Jam. Uh, first of all, I, I did arrive there uh, to serve as the United Nations Command Security Battalion Battalion Commander the same week uh, as Singapore as the Singapore summit. Um, my role there was really to provide security for the diplomats, for the generals uh, of United Nations Command uh, and between the Republic of Korea and the North Korean government and the United States government to have a place where they could come to dialogue. Uh, and for many, many years, that's been the primary role of the security battalion is, is just to have the opportunity to provide that security and to keep a place safe uh, for that dialogue. What happened uh, over the two years that we were there, um, some by hard work, but also a lot by good luck, um, and also on the shoulders definitely of giants before us, who went through uh, you know, 67 years of periods of immense violence and long periods of silence. Um, there was tremendous violence in the Joint Security Area in 1968, 1975, 1976, 1984. Uh, we lost soldiers uh, and had many soldiers injured uh, in conflict there, trying to keep it as an open place where people could eventually come uh, to hopefully one day sign a peace treaty. But in between those periods of violence, uh, there was a lot of soldiers there that um, constantly de-escalated situations. Uh, soldiers on both sides, uh, Korean, uh, American, North Korean, uh, who took risks in order to make sure that violence didn't erupt again there in Panmunjom. Um, so when I took command, it was during a period of tremendous opportunity where we were able to engage our counterparts from the KPA uh, really for the first time as a security battalion since 1976 when Captain Arthur Boniface was killed uh, in the axe murder incident there in Panmunjom. 
Uh, when I first arrived, the summit had just completed and there'd been some agreements on sharing uh, and returning remains, repatriation of remains that the president and the chairman had agreed to. Uh, so that was our first real role and in interaction with the North Koreans was preparing the flags, preparing the caskets uh, that would move north to once on North Korea uh, in order to bring home our service members, something that the world was able to watch uh, when those remains eventually landed in Seoul uh, and then again in Hawaii. Uh, but that was our first real interaction when we sent those north in Panmunjom uh, to our North Korean counterparts. Uh, things followed quickly from there. Uh, in, in July, uh, there was the first phone call that went across the, the line. United Nations Command, as part of its commitment uh, to keeping an, oper an open door to peace, maintains a phone line uh, right there in Panmunjom. And uh, UNCMAC, the Military Armistice Commission, uh, since 1952 has always maintained an open dialogue. Um, I'm not sure how long that specific phone line has been there, but for decades, uh, they have made phone calls every day. Um, but since 2013, the North Koreans uh, really weren't answering. Um, we would make those phone calls daily, twice a day, uh, as part of our commitment, and we received no response. But then in July of 2018, we were all in the room um, preparing to make the three o'clock phone call when suddenly the phone rang in our direction. And it, it was kind of like a scene in the movies uh, where a phone rings and everyone in the room pauses and all sound stops and you kind of stare at the phone and wonder if it's real. Um, so we had a young lieutenant, she answered the phone and uh, that her North Korean counterpart uh, said, hey, I'm just doing a phone check. And since then, uh, to in include up till now, the North Koreans are answering that phone twice a day. Uh, and it shows that uh, regardless of how things are going, um, the line is there and the, the avenue is there and that's, that's what UNC tries, tries to do. Um, as a result of many of these meetings, um, our battalion was able uh, to secure general officer level talks uh, in Panmunjom between the United Nations Command and the Korean People's Army. Uh, and I was very fortunate uh, at the time that General Brooks uh, gave a seat at the table to the security battalion since we were the ones um, implementing a lot of the changes that could be coming uh, he thought that we should be able to be there. So it was just by luck and by his decision that I was able to be a part of this and witness it. Um, and I think part of his, his rationale may have been just so we knew exactly uh, what we needed to implement in order to help talks advance. In September uh, of 2018, as you all know, the comprehensive military agreement was signed between the Republic of Korea and the DPRK. Uh, now, while United Nations Command was not a part of this agreement, um, United Nations Command felt that it supported the goals of the Armistice Agreement and the goals of the United Nations Command. So it was in the interest of peace, so it was in the interest of UNC. And so from then on, we began to plan uh, the demining of Panmunjom, followed by the demilitarization of Panmunjom, which I think was extraordinarily uh, significant. That was the first time that those blue buildings that you see in the background behind Gene Lee right there, was the first time uh, since the Korean War started that there were no weapons in Panmunjom. Um, and so during the demining and the demilitarization, we had a tremendous amount of interactions with our North Korean counterparts. Uh, the soldiers who serve on the other side of that line and who the security battalion had not interacted with since 1976. Um, what I would like to talk about today through the moderated discussion uh, is stories that you may have questions about regarding my interactions with the Korean People's Army, uh, regarding the tremendous ROC and U.S. soldiers that make up the United Nations Command Security Battalion, and also just some experiences of living on the demilitarized zone uh, with the villagers of Daesongdong, the only uh, active village in the entire DMZ. Um, and so I'm very excited to share about that. What, what I am not here to discuss today, I just have to start with this, is, is current policy uh, or my personal predictions of, of what may come or what may happen um, in North Korea. It, as, a, as a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army, that's not my place, uh, but I'm happy to share with you some very fascinating history uh, that we were fortunate to be a part of. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Morrow. And I am, I am very much looking forward to hearing a bit more about your interactions with the North Koreans because one thing that has been pointed out to me is that you had more interactions or were on the North Korean side more than anyone in 
the UN command for decades, uh, perhaps since 1976. I did want to back up and ask you to just explain a little bit of the history, uh, because you know, for so many of us, and I think a lot of people on this call will have, sorry, we're, we're just gonna get some images up. Um, we've got some slide, we've got some images from both sides of the DMZ. Just thought it might be interesting for you to have a visual glimpse. As I mentioned, I think many of us have been to the DMZ. I've been to the DMZ on both sides. Uh, and it is very theatrical in some sense, uh, but it is also a place, as you mentioned in your essay for the Wilson Quarterly, of great danger. And it looks like you have the wrong Twitter. Oh no, that's our Instagram, great. Okay, thanks to our amazing team of interns. Um, so this is also a place of tension, but just remind us a little bit about some of the tension in the past. In 1976, you mentioned, because that, that incident, and I think we have a picture of it coming up, uh, certainly set the tone for the tension inside the JSA. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gene. So in, in 1976, uh, the JSA actually had North and South Korean soldiers uh, serving essentially side by side. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say working together, um, but, but physically intermingled, almost like in a soccer match, uh, opposing sides, but in the same space on the field. Um, there was a, a outpost at the Bridge of No Return. The Bridge of No Return made famous uh, because that's where we exchanged our prisoners of war during the Korean War in Operation Little Switch and Operation Big Switch, uh, when prisoners of war were given a chance to either return to North Korea or to, to, stay, um, to stay where they were. And, but once they made that choice, they, they couldn't come back. So there was an outpost down there at the bridge, uh, a small U UNC outpost and a small KPA uh, North Korean outpost. But there was a large tree preventing the view uh, of, of that outpost from other security on the UNC side. So there was a decision made that there, there was occasionally fist fights. Um, soldiers from both sides would you know, insult each other, it would escalate, they would beat each other up, but it, it never escalated beyond like bullying or gang fighting. Uh, it, never, it never escalated to the point where someone thought their life was in danger. Uh, but we still wanted to keep an eye on our troops down there. So in 1976, Captain Arthur Boniface uh, led a small work detail, uh, only three days before he was supposed to return to the United States uh, to his wife, Marcia, and, and three little kids. Um, and he led his team down there just to cut down the tree. Uh, some some uh, UNC soldiers and some uh, some workers at, at the bridge. When they got down there, the North the North Koreans said, "Hey, this tree was planted by Kim Kim Jong Il, or I'm sorry, Kim Il Sung. Um, we would like you to not cut it down." Uh, this is was very common, and Captain Boniface ignored this this request. And the North Koreans came back with thirty. Um, Captain Boniface, I presume, knew he was fixing to get into a fight. Um, but what he didn't realize is when the North Korean captain gave the order, uh, kill, his, his group of 30 men seized the axes uh, and overwhelmed the workforce, killing uh, Lieutenant Mark Barrett and Captain Arthur Boniface. Um, immediately thereafter, uh, the White House oversaw uh, the actual tearing down of the tree in Operation Paul Bunyan. Uh, Secretary Kissinger, President Ford, uh, really thought that potentially this could push the Korean War back into a hot war uh, and back into a conflict. Um, fortunately, the tree was taken down without incident that day. Uh, President Moon was actually in the military at the time and said that this, this mission, this operation had a significant impact on how, on how he views conflict and how he views war. Um, but after that day, uh, both sides, North and South Korea and UNC, agreed to put a line in the middle and that no longer would the soldiers interact. So then ra rather, like, right, ra rather than like being like a soccer match where both sides were interacting, uh, it became more like a football, a football match or a football game where we lined up directly against each other uh, on both sides of a line and, and we were protecting our line. Uh, so 1976 was a, a critical turning point. Uh, it ended the interaction between the security battalions. Um, we, we, my team and I uh, did have some of the most interaction uh, ever in the last decades with the North Koreans. 
but we can't forget that UNCMAC, the Military Armistice Commission, um, has had a lot of discussion, conversation over the phone line. Uh, during the 90s, there was a lot of conversation between UNCMAC and their equivalent on the, on the North Korean side. Um, and during the sunshine period uh, prior to 2013, there was also uh, a lot of good conversation happening. Um, but as far as the security battalion goes, yeah, yes, Gene, we did have potentially the most interaction in, in 40 years. I think it's possible that you and I might be two of the only Americans the North Koreans know by name. <laughs> Uh, because I've vis visited so often from the North Korean side, I've had people, tourists, tell me that they still ask about me and where I've been. So it's, um, but I want to hear a little bit more about that because as you, as you know, 2018 really marked a shift in the interaction between the North Koreans and, and, and you and your colleagues. Can you tell us a little bit more? I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious to know what you thought or what you knew about this post before you got to Korea and, and what you were prepared for uh, and how this experience may have changed your perception of the North Koreans. So when I first found out that I was coming to this post uh, back in 2017, um, I, I knew about the DMZ, of course, I knew about the Korean War. Uh, but I wasn't really too sure on what it meant to be assigned to Pan Moon Jam. Um, I knew that there was a lot of orientations given, that telling the United Nations Command story was important. Um, but e even had someone given me a full rundown of what the job entailed, I don't think any of us could have predicted what was to come in 2018 and 2019. Um, I think we got to go back uh, six months before I arrived under the tenor, tenure of Lieutenant Colonel Matt Farmer and his team. Um, when Sergeant O uh, defected from North Korea to South Korea. Uh, that was an incredibly tense moment. The rhetoric uh, around the world was high and likely inching towards war, or at least outsiders could have, could have assessed that we were moving in that direction. Um, and Sergeant O came across that line, um, essentially looking for his freedom. When he did, the North Koreans in Panmunjom at, in the joint security area where we live and work, uh, opened fire on Sardino as he fled. Our troops uh, held their fire during that, during that shootout um, until Sergeant O got across the line. Uh, our job is to de-escalate. And if our troops weren't in danger, and if people our troops were responsible for weren't in danger, then it was not their job uh, to fire back on those North Korean soldiers. Uh, when for a young soldier, to be in that proximity to a firefight, I think, I think every ounce of their being would, would make them want to fire back. Um, but, ha but had there been carnage and a lot of dead in the JSA in November of 2017, um, we certainly can't revise history, but it makes you wonder, um, would the, June f or the January 1st speech uh, from Chairman Kim uh, have been as open to some potential change with the 2018 Olympics. The combined teams have happened only only about eight weeks uh, after what could have been a very deadly incident in the JSA. Um, so, so I think predicting what could have happened in 2018 and 2019, uh, I'm sure none of us could have done that. Um, I'll never forget the first time I had the chance to really step across into North Korea for a meeting. Uh, with our North Korean counterparts. Uh, for anyone who's visited Panmunjom, uh, you know we provide the opportunity to any visitors to actually step into North Korea, uh, physically and legally in North Korea, inside those blue buildings. So I've done that many times. Um, but the first time that I actually stepped across the military demarcation line and walked north uh, up to the buildings on the north side for a meeting, um, it was fairly incredible. Uh, I think, I think, Current U.S. soldiers, particularly those of my age that have spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, might, might in an odd way be uniquely prepared for a situation like this because, you know, part of our job uh, after 2003 and then uh, in Afghanistan um, was to talk to former Al-Qaeda or former Taliban and, and to try to come to an understanding. And, and that experience uh, to be able to talk to someone who you were also uh, prepared to be in a fight with, uh, I, think, I think helped my 
counterparts, my peers, uh, and those of us that, that were involved in this situation with the North Koreans. So I think it gave us an open mind uh, as we moved into this situation. The early encounters with the KPA were incredibly scripted, uh, always professional, uh, but they, they followed, um, it was almost like they came in knowing exactly what they were gonna say. They weren't gonna change anything regardless of what we said. And that's how the meetings went. Uh, they were very predictable, very formal, very cold, uh, if you will, but always very professional. It, it was, I never detected any unprofessionalism from our KPA counterparts. Uh, and this represented a change because um, my young soldiers in the past have been standing on the line when uh, their KPA counterparts would say derogatory things or give a threatening signal or act like they were going to reach for their pistol. Um, and so I think that the soldiers on the North Korean side sensed a different tone coming from their leadership and they were following suit. Uh, as we interacted more, uh, we had many opportunities to spend six hours, eight hours, one day, 12 hours, just side by side uh, doing some work. And this is tactical work. This wasn't, this wasn't strategic diplomacy. Uh, we, we were not we were not doing things um, that would make the news. These were small tactical interactions, uh, but for periods of time, they were the only real interactions we were having uh, with the North Koreans. And so we, we felt that they were important and they provided a way to, to get a foothold uh, for those that do have the strategic talks, for our diplomats and for our generals. As we had more interaction, uh, we saw them start to loosen up. Um, they would ask questions about our families, but not, not necessarily a, an intelligence gathering way, though, of course, I'm sure that that, that was happening. Um, but they asked questions about what sports we like to play. Um, they found out I was a basketball fanatic who loved the Chicago Bulls. And there was a connection immediately there because North Koreans, particularly the chairman, uh, were Bulls fans. And after that, every North Korean that met me for the first time would say, oh, I heard you're from Chicago. And they'd ask about food and culture. And uh, they probably heard more about Chicago than they ever wanted to hear, but uh, I'm proud of my city. Uh, we talked about family. Uh, they would share occasionally a photograph of their family, talk about their aspirations for their sons uh, to serve in the military, to serve the chairman, uh, but also to grow up to become engineers or professors uh, or doctors. Uh, they're just kind of the same things that, that any of us would want for our children uh, as they aspire in, into new professions. Um, I would say that they always, always made sure we knew where their loyalty lied. Uh, there, there was no question uh, that if, if we asked them something about the current situation, uh, we knew what side they were going to come down on, and, and there was no, no hedging of, of that. Uh, we asked one day, hey, how are you planning to celebrate your new year? Uh, and they said, well, we're going to have our family come to our house, and we're going to have a big meal. And I said, that's, that's how we celebrate our, our new year as well. They said, but then we'll spend the afternoon visiting every statue of the chairman, uh, chairman's father and chairman's grandfather uh, that we can find in our town. And you almost waited for it to not be true or to be followed up with kind of a laugh, but then you realize that that's exactly what they were doing after dinner. They were gonna go uh, to every statue in town and pay tribute. Um, so their loyalty was impressive uh, to their regime and, and to their army. Uh, I think one story that I love to tell was that when we were on the South Korean side, we had a group of North Korean colonels and we we're looking at a mountain in the Kaesong Heights. Uh, and it's a mountain that uh, in Korean lore, uh, is said that, that many people would go to that mountain in hopes of fertility because the mountain looks like a pregnant woman lying on her back. And I told the North Korean colonel, we were standing looking at the vista and you know it was just a rare quiet moment and I told him that story. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, we tell the same story from the other side of the mountain. And I thought that was just a pretty powerful way about how, how people are connected through narrative and through history. Um, and uh, it was just something I won't soon forget. Happy to answer any other specific questions or tell any other stories. So is it safe to say that this has changed how you see the North Koreans? I would, I would like to say that ho hopefully I didn't go in uh, thinking of them as, as evil, um, but rather people in a difficult situation. Uh, but what I, what I did think about that I hadn't previously is just um, 
what, what the lack of information does to a society. Uh, you know, when, when we met our counterparts in Iraq and Afghanistan, quite often they had access to the global internet. Uh, they knew as much about things that we knew about, um, whether it was pop culture or whether it was about global news. Um, our, our counterparts were informed. And, and what I found in North Korea was that they didn't know a lot of things uh, that were happening in the world. Uh, sometimes we would share a story of something in the news. I remember the morning uh, President Bush passed away. Uh, I was just making small talk and said, you know, our, our president passed away uh, yesterday. And I was surprised to hear one North Korean say, oh, the father or the son. And I told him it was the father. Um, and they asked questions about it, but had no, had no knowledge that it had occurred, um, even though it was the front page news on CNN International Edition. They just have no access to that type of thing. I think you make a good point. You know, we have so little information about North Korea, especially now when they've shut the borders. The North Korean state has such tight hold and a very, uh, I would say, industrious propaganda machinery. And so they're, they're good about cultivating the images that we see of North Korea. But I think that um, just beyond that DMZ, that sort of theatrical set that the North Koreans have created, for me, coming from Pyongyang, from the, from the North Korean side into the DMZ, you do see the poverty that lies just outside that zone. And for people like my parents who survived the Korean War, often when I show them pictures of, the, of North Korea today, they will, my mother will say that's what it looked like in 1953. So much of it just has not developed. And of course, and that is such a huge contrast to South Korea, which as we know, you know world's 12th largest economy, so vibrant, um, such a leader in so many different areas and has come so far. And so it's always a stark reminder when you're dealing with the North Koreans, how different the two Koreas are in that sense, how cut off the North Koreans are. I want to, I want to, I want to thank you because, you know, I, one of my goals really was to, one of my goals with our program is to put, um, to give voice to and to humanize the North Koreans as well, even as we think about these bigger challenges of how to deal with this persistent threat. The Wilson Quarterly issue also tries to get at how the North Koreans use the conflict with the United States in its propaganda and also to justify the building of nuclear weapons. So all of this is intertwined. And so it's, I think that's a picture of the stump that we're showing from that Boniface. Is that right? Um, I wanted to, um, I know that my interns had a question. They wanted to hear a little bit about what your life is like. You've got small children, what your life was like inside the DMZ. And then I do want to hand over to Abe Denmark because I am not feeling so well. And we'll ask him to, I'm going to punt to him and have him ask a few questions and we'll open up to the Q&A. Thanks, Jean, and uh, thank you, Sean, uh, so much for doing this. Um, I'm curious about answering the question from the interns about what life was like, um, especially for your family um, during this time. Um, I have a few other questions as well. Maybe we could start with that. Go ahead, Sean. So I, that's a great question. And uh, my wife, Megan, uh, who's out there listening right now, um, probably could answer it better than I if she was in here, but I would say it was, it was a wonderful experience uh, to live there in Panmunjom on the DMZ. It was also very difficult. Um, Megan and I have three young boys uh, who lived in Seoul, and even though it's only about 45 miles away, um, we worked six days a week uh, in the lead up to the present, worked for I think seven weeks straight. Um, there was a lot of times where Megan and the boys thought I would be home, but I wasn't. Uh, but for all those difficult times, um, I feel like our kids were able to come up to Camp Boniface on some weekends or when school was out uh, and really get a chance to experience um, not just Korean culture, but like the actual Korean people and the Korean army. And living uh, on a combined base, we only had approximately 80 American soldiers in that unit and 700 Koreans. Um, my deputy commanders, Lee Eugene and Che Jin Young um, are like brothers to me now. And our kids had the opportunity to play with their kids, to run around on the camp, um, to experience games with their Korean friends, uh, to go and understand Daesongdong village, 
uh, and what it means to be in a farming community. They participated in the rice harvest in October of 2019. Um, it, it was really a, a beautiful and wonderful place. And, uh, and I love Seoul and is Seoul is a phenomenal city, but I feel like by getting up into Panmunjom uh, and living in the community there, uh, we, we had a, a great experience. Um, we were very sad to go, but I will definitely say we're happy to all be under one roof again uh, for, for seven days a week and, and know that my current job isn't gonna send me away uh, too often like that. Absolutely, I understand, I hear that. I, uh, I have a few other questions, but I also wanna make sure that our audience knows that they can pose questions to you as well. Uh, they can tweet questions to uh, at Asia program or at Korea underscore center, or they can email questions to asia at wilsoncenter.org. Now, your article is a tremendous piece. I really appreciate you doing that. And so many of the stories and insights I thought were very good. I, I was uh, glad that you mentioned how uh, yours and other experiences um, of your, of your uh, uh, soldiers uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan helped you prepare for the, the complexities. In fact, when I was reading your article uh, and you talked about the trilateral inspections and you had to train your, your people to be ready to be friendly, but ready for a fight as well. And it reminded me of um, something that uh, former Secretary Mattis would say, and I actually heard him say it in person a couple times, where he would say uh, to be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everybody you meet. Um, and I think that our, our soldiers are very good at understanding the differences and being prepared uh, for all sorts of different interactions. Um, another story that I thought was interesting and uh, something that you, um, would be helpful if you could talk about a bit, you talk of in, in your article, you talk a bit about how the old fashioned phone rang for the first time in, in a long time, everyone sort of looked at the phone. And the person who ended up picking up the phone was a flight lieutenant from New Zealand. Uh, and I thought that was important because it reminds us that you were the commander of the UN command security at the time. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about uh, the role of the UN uh, and the UN force there and the, the different hats that you and other folks in USFK wear. And what you see is the significance of the UN role uh, for what's, what we're doing up at the DMZ. Thank you. So that, that's a, a really good question. Uh, and, and I'll actually start the answer with an anecdote. Um, just before I took this job, uh, I had an opportunity uh, to introduce Ambassador Haley uh, at an event at the University of Chicago. And uh, prior to introducing her, uh, I met her backstage. And when we met, she said, you know, Sean, the UN doesn't really own UNC uh, or United Nations Command. And I say, yes, ma'am, I know that. But it is, it's a very popular misconception. Um, we, we aren't wearing blue hats and blue berets. We're, not, we're no longer a UN mission. Um, back when the Korean War started, the UN itself was also a, a very nation organization um, and still figuring out how they handle international conflict. So they gave the US a charter uh, to carry their flag uh, and to go under the under the UN banner, um, but it is a United States mission, um, United Nations Command, uh, led by a four-star United States General, uh, General Abrams, and um, we we answer to the United States government. So it is an alliance. It's a wonderful alliance, uh, a, a member nation of the Republic of Korea and 17 sending states. Uh, that participate and are ready to support peace on the Korean Peninsula, um, but but definitely uh, not a UN mission in the traditional sense like we would see in Africa or in the Balkans. Very helpful. I, the the different hats that are worn, the different the UN the UN USFK commander is also the UNC commander, the, and with um, different discussions happening within the alliance about potential changes to the force structure, these nuances are really important, I appreciate that. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you that came up from uh, reading from your uh, article, um, you talked a bit about how the personal relationships and engagements that you had with uh, the North Korean counterparts, especially and that when the relations between the US and North Korea seemed to be warming up, that they got friendlier, you were able to talk with them and build some rapport. As things chilled down, they were a bit more distant, but you got some indications of uh, still some friendliness with some hidden smiles and things. Um, and it was curious is that the personal interaction seemed to reflect the um, broader state of the political alliance. And I'm curious if, um, on one hand, if you think that that's 
um, fairly consistent about what's been going on in Korea uh, in the, with the North Koreans that the personal relations sort of ebb and flow with the broader strategic relationship. And if it's your sense that it's primarily the North Korean behavior that changes, or if you think also from our, from our side, from the South side, there's a different approach in how we approach things, how we in, look at the North Koreans, how we engage with them, depending on what's happening in the broader context. Thanks. I, I think that um, the, the, the vibe in Panmunjom definitely ebbs and flows with what's happening at a strategic level, but I think it's largely because of how the North Korean soldiers perceive that relationship to be. Um, we are so lucky uh, to be in a democratic army uh, where we're empowered, where our sergeants and our privates are empowered to make decisions, um, to make mistakes even. Uh, but General Abrams, when he first took command, said to me, commander to commander interaction at the local level. So me, myself, my troops, and then and the North Koreans, he said it's critical to building trust and confidence uh, inside Panmunjom and in the JSA. So even when things wouldn't go well uh, in the, in the uh, diplomacy sector or the strategic sector, we would still be kind, be polite, um, following, you know, Secretary Mattis's well-known advice also. Uh, we were always ready for a fight at any time, uh, but we didn't fear being too nice to the North Koreans. How, how we, would our superiors perceive that? But I absolutely believe that uh, in any interaction, my counterparts on the North Korean side, the KPA, had a tremendous amount of pressure of just how they acted. Uh, Gene used the term theatrics uh, early on in this, in this Zoom call. And I think that that's impor more important to them than it is to us. Um, they never wanted to be seen as being too kind to us if they thought maybe their bosses didn't want them being kind to us. Uh, the, the repercussions for being wrong were extraordinary on their side. Uh, whereas on our side, we had the freedom um, to try to move uh, and do things as long as they were within the UNC commander's intent. Along, along those lines, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about your sense of how the atmosphere at the JSA has evolved um, since the North and South uh, withdrew their weapons from the JSA. Has that had a palpable effect on the vibe, as you say, um, at the JSA itself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in, at first, when it happened in 2018, uh, it was just a, a combination of many things. Demining was an operation where we worked together, uh, UNC and the KPA, to demine the JSA. Demilitarization, pulling the weapons out, is, is instantly going to reduce uh, the, the threat of someone dying uh, and all of the interactions that we were having. So all those things together really created a, a perfect storm to have good things happen. Um, where those changes are still felt is that even now, as I was leaving and things weren't as good as they were 18 months ago, for, for a variety of reasons, there still wasn't this feeling that you could get killed in the JSA at any minute. Now that doesn't mean that, that UNC troops aren't prepared for a fight, that we have ready forces that can get in there quickly to protect. Um, but, but when you have a loaded pistol and you're, you, know, you have your hand at the ready six meters away from a North Korean, uh, the margin of error is so small. And I think by demilitarizing the JSA, we reduce the chance of miscalculation. Uh, you know, I, think, I think that um, some people made the argument that there might be more of a case for an incident because when there's no guns, you're not afraid of, of dying. Um, so you might be more inclined to have a fist fight. I didn't see that happen. Um, it's, you know, it's almost like nuclear deterrence theory, right? But uh, at the smallest local level. Um, but what I found is that the absence of weapons noticeably contributed to a relaxation of tension. Mm -hmm. And even when things got more tense, they weren't as bad as they were when we all had guns. One of the questions that came in on, on this topic, uh, in your article, you talked a bit about um, during the disarmament, there, there was a period where there was a hollow ramp and you offered to open it and they said they trusted you with the crowbar. Um, so uh, one of the questions that came is actually from a former UNC Mac, uh, asked if there's a um, sort, sort of instruction, uh, inspection protocol in place to ensure that neither side violates the JSA disarmament agreement. Um, to make sure that no one's actually sneaking stuff in, I guess. Is, is who, 
So I would have to say that if you really wanted to sneak something in on either side, you probably could. Uh, but there is an extraordinary measure in the comprehensive military agreement um, that I don't think I touched on in my article. But in addition to the demining and demilitarization, we agreed to share surveillance. Um, so all of the camera feeds from the North Korean Tactical Operations Center in Panmunjom come right into my Tactical Operations Center. And all of our camera feeds uh, go into their Tactical Operations Center. So we are sharing each other's surveillance. Um, and we made some handshake gentlemen's agreements that I, I wouldn't have believed could have held, um, but about what to focus on, about not moving the cameras, about not shutting the cameras off. Uh, and for you know almost two years now, those agreements have held. And so we see what they see and they see what we see. That's great. That's, that's really helpful. Um, one, of our, one of my colleagues, uh, Katie Stellar Blanchett, um, who's a, a real expert on a lot of these issues, um, wanted to ask a question about um, how KPA personnel are taught about the Americans and their expectations of Americans. Um, you have a story in your piece about um, one of your counterparts saying, we were taught how to count by counting one American master, two American bastards. Uh, and one of the pictures actually that were shown during, uh, during the conversation had a kid drawing a picture of, the, uh, of Seoul, uh, I guess it was the uh, occupation of Seoul during the Korean War. Um, and so wondering if you could speak a bit more about um, your interactions with KPA personnel, uh, in particular their preconceptions of American soldiers beforehand, um, what they learned about the US military growing up, what they learned from their interactions with you, what you learned about interactions with them. Yeah, so to expand a little bit on the, on the piece in the article, uh, during demining, demining is obviously a, an inherently dangerous operation. Um, and we just knew that the, the caliber of our medics uh, was, was probably a little bit better than, than what they may have had. And so we offered, hey, you know, there, there's a likelihood that someone could lose a foot uh, to one of these uh, old North Korean mines. Um, do you, do you know how to prop, properly tie a tourniquet? Can we teach a class to help you make sure the immediate actions and reactions in the event of, of, you know, something, something tragic like that, um, to just make sure everyone's okay. And, uh, they seemed extraordinarily grateful for it, uh, and surprised and, and asked to the effect of like, wh why do you care so much about what happens to us? And our, our answer was that, because if, if we do good here, you know, KPA, UNC, South Korea, if, if we do well together, it opens doors for our bosses to do good on the really important stuff. And so we said, we, we need to be successful for bigger things. And, uh, and we're in this together. We're kind of a team here. And, th and that's when they made the comment um, that, you know, you guys are different than we were taught you would be. And to me, that's probably one of the most poignant moments uh, in my two years there, uh, because it, it just, one, helped us realize what information and propaganda mean to a population, to a people, um, how, how hate and mistrust can be built and developed, um, but how something as simple as, as interaction can start slowly, slowly chip away at that. And uh, I, I like to think I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And, and I know that um, some of the things that were said in, in our personal one-on-one -on -one interactions may have been said for theatrics or for effect or to get something in return. Um, but I, I truly believed in some of the ways that they opened up, uh, that they shared the stories of their children, um, that they, one, one old officer even said, maybe, maybe someday our grandkids can play together. Um, th those are powerful sentiments. And, uh, and I think that, you know, we might have not changed North Korea uh, during these interactions in Panmunjom, um, but I think we definitely changed a few individual minds. That's wonderful. I have um, a, a final question for you. Um, and just wanted to, um, first off, I spent a lot of time working with your predecessors um, when I was in the Pentagon, just incredibly impressed with the uh, skill and professionalism that everybody there, are, the Americans, the contributing country, the South Koreans, uh, demonstrate there on a daily basis is really incredible. Um, even during the tensest of times, I was there just a few days after the uh, August 2015 uh, land, landmine incident. And uh, even at that time, I think the, everyone was calm, professional, uh, and I'm just incredibly impressive. So th thank you for 
uh, your service generally and uh, at the DMZ. Now, one question that came in um, that I think is, is very important uh, that I'm going to add some to. Um, uh, one of our, someone from our audience wanted to ask you, have you seen the movie JSA? And if so, what do you think about it? And I wanted to add, I assume you've also watched Crash Landing on to you um, and love it as much as I do. And what are the best paragliding places at the DMZ that you would recommend? So, so I'm going to disappoint probably all of you right now because I have not seen JSA yet. Um, from Jump Street, when we started demining and demilitarizing uh, the JSA, I can't tell you how many, uh, especially Koreans, would tell me, "Be careful! This sounds like it could be like the JSA. Don't don't get too friendly." Um, I will. I tried many times to watch it, but my Netflix account on the DMZ actually thought I was in North Korea, so a lot a lot of my stuff was banned. Uh, and, and I haven't got around to uh, crash landing into you yet. I, I was too busy watching Itaewon class. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this and for contributing to this piece. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have to work with you and look forward to keeping work with, with you. Uh, Jean, I'll turn things over to you to close things out. Yeah, I just, I find that last exchange so hilarious. I think that we did put up some images because you mentioned, Sean, you mentioned um, Fault, which was another movie that portrays the DMC. I have to say, I, I watched JSA and all, all the other movies that were, uh, that portray and really imagine, you know, this is people's imagine, filmmakers' imaginations running wild about what might happen between North Korean and South Korean soldiers inside the DMC. But I cannot get past the, I am still only at the beginning of the second episode of Crash Landing on You. Because I have to say, for those of us who know, who spend time in North Korea, you just don't want to relive it all. So, and also it's just so painful because we all know it's just so unlikely. So I'm going to get there. Um, it is something that I'm planning to watch, but I think for uh, Lieutenant Colonel Morrill too, it's probably a little too close. It's a little too close to home right now, but maybe in a couple of years time, you'll, you'll go back and watch it. Um, I just wanted to ask one more question before we close, and I, I should point out that we're, we're going to try to wrap this up around four o'clock. But I, I wanted to ask you, given that this is the 70th anniversary of the start of the Korean War, and you know, it's really important to me that we not only look at the history, which is so important and essential, but that we look at the present and the future. But how do you want us and how do you think we should be thinking about this anniversary? I wanted to, and, and before, I, um, before you answer, I wanted to mention that I think the UN command is doing a great job trying to um, ask veterans for memories, memorabilia. So please, all of you go to the, um, if, you, if your veterans were watching or you know veterans, please help the UN command collect and, and promote and share and save these memories. It's something that we would like to do as well. I shared my own family's experience and it has sparked a lot of discussion among Korean Americans whose parents uh, survived the war and became Americans, some of whom went back to North Korea as Americans to meet their Korean North Korean family. Um, this is a moment for us to remember this, but I do want to ask you um, how you think we should think about this as somebody who, who did live the past two years at the very core of this conflict. Um, and I will mention, as I mentioned, the UN Command does have a great Twitter feed. Um, we will be sharing our, some of the stories and images that we discussed and touched on today on our um, Instagram feed, so please follow us. And, and with that, Sean, any final words on how to think about this Korean War anniversary? Thanks, Jean. Um, and as I close out, first, I just want to say thank you again to everyone for, for affording me this platform and this opportunity just to, to share some history and uh, to share kind of the mission of United Nations Command and, and what they do. Um, I think that uh, when we think about the Korean War 70 years on, um, I think first, it's just important to think about the sacrifice um, of people made, the, the people on the Korean Peninsula, both on the north and the south side, the families that were torn apart, uh, some that are still hoping to, to meet each other again. Um, I, I think that the sacrifice is amazing. Uh, I think that the teamwork uh, of, of the world coming together uh, really to, to save the peninsula uh, and to look at what South Korea and the Republic of Korea has become 
uh, in the last 70 years. Just such an amazing, vibrant, you know, nation. Um, I think that those are some of the important things to think about that when, when there is a problem in the world, everyone can come together uh, and have a tremendous outcome, even if it wasn't for the whole peninsula, um, just what was possible for, for the Republic of Korea. Um, I think that the idea that the, the armistice has held for so long is something that um, I think is worthy of scholars' attention. Um, we're always looking for reasons of, you know, war termination and, and, and how you end wars, but for an armistice agreement to hold uh, pretty much perfectly uh, for this long, it, it's an amazing tribute to the document, but it's also a tribute to the, to the people that have, that have helped carry it out um, from all the nations that contribute. So um, I, th I think I'm proud to have served in United Nations Command, um, not just as an American officer, but as part of a really great international organization that um, is doing good things on the peninsula. So. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the peace treaty can eventually come about, uh, but that remains to be seen. Thank you. Um, I believe we're gonna wrap up our discussion now. Um, it's been wonderfully enriching, and I would like to thank our Wilson Center Director, Jane Harmon, for introducing. Um, Jean Lee, thank you very much. Abe Denmark, thank you. And especially Lieutenant Colonel Sean Morrow, it has been an absolute pleasure um, collaborating with you to get this very important article to print. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to look at Lieutenant Colonel Morrow's article and all of the articles that we have in our most recent issue, Korea 70 Years On. You'll be able to see them at wilsonquarterly.com. Very easy address. Um, I also wanted to mention again that our History and Public Policy program has also been very busy commemorating this anniversary. If you go to their Sources and Methods blog, you'll be able to see a lot of the critical documents um, that have helped determine um, why the war started, um, the, the course of it, and what's happened since then. And please stay tuned as well, um, both to the Korea Center's Twitter, Asia Program Twitter, Wilson Quarterly, because we will be having more events um, in the next few weeks, and um, we'd like you to come and join us for those as well. So thank you very much. And everyone be well and have a great rest of your afternoon.